All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jacob Tomlinson, and I am the Speaker of the Senate for the Student Government Association. Uh, at this time, I call this special session of SGA uh, to order uh, for the purpose of the State of the Student Address. First, uh, I'd like to give some quick introductions. Um, up at the, on stage with me are all the members of the cabinet of the Student Government Association, uh, and the cabinet embodies the executive branch of SGA. <clears throat> Much like our actual government, both federal and state, the executive branch sees to it that legislation SGA passes comes to fruition. Please join me in giving the cabinet uh, a big round of applause for their diligence this year. Along the sides of the room, you'll see uh, these are all of our senators in SGA. Uh, they represent various constituencies across campus. Uh, so for example, BSA, uh, Panhellenic Council, all of the residence halls, Unity. Uh, they, uh, their job is to legislate. So senators, please stand and be recognized for all of your hard work this year. Thank you. I would also like to welcome all the faculty, staff, uh, and administrators that are here today. Uh, we appreciate your presence and commitment to Western. Obviously, without you, Western wouldn't be the outstanding university that we all know that it is. Uh, so please join me in giving all of them a big round of applause. <laughs> Lastly, uh, but equally as important, I would like to welcome and thank all the students that are here today. Um, obviously, you're here ultimately to learn more about the budgetary, budgetary issues facing the university and uh, the state, uh, but also your presence shows a tremendous support for your university. Uh, so thank you very, very much for being here. Uh. I'm going to start off with some comments about student, the Student Government Association and its role on campus. Uh, following me, the student member to the Board of Trustees, Mr. Michael Quigley, will give some remarks about his role and the role of the board. Um, and lastly, we'll conclude with uh, some comments from the Student Government Association President, uh, Mr. Will Gradle. We'll be discussing some negative topics today, so please, if you hear something that you like, uh, we'll, let's try to stay a beat, go ahead and shout woohoo or uh, give some applause. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, so to begin, uh, for those of you that are not aware, SGA is the organization on campus that represents uh, all the students. And to give you an extremely brief description of what it looks like, it is composed of an executive branch and a legislative branch. And probably not surprisingly, the legislative branch's job is to legislate. So in other words, their job is to come to SGA with concerns of students, um, and we try to find the best solution to fit those concerns. So far, uh, I'd say that we have done a better job um, at talking and you know, debating, compromising than anyone in Springfield. Uh, but that, maybe that's just my opinion. I don't, I'm not really sure. But upon passing solutions in the form of legislation, uh, the executive branch springs into action and tries to work with whatever body is necessary to bring about the proposed change of the legislation. So that may seem kind of abstract to some of you, so I'll give you a, a couple concrete examples. Last year, I was a senator, and I had seen several individuals riding their bikes uh, across the quad. And one person, I uh, even saw them fall off of their bike trying to swerve in and out of groups of students. So I thought that that was potentially a dangerous situation and maybe I could do something to help fix that. So I, went, I brought it to SGA, uh, we came up with a solution, passed some legislation, and SGA worked with the Director of Facilities Management, uh, Mr. Scott Coker, who is here today. Thank you for being here, Scott. And uh, we put in bike lanes in the quad to create a safer environment for both pedestrians and for bike riders. 
So that's just one, one really good example of um, something that we can do on campus. Another great example of SGA uh, getting together and, um, is in, our, in regards to our efforts of the printing proposal. Uh, some of you might remember that last year a proposal was brought to SGA and to IT governance to limit the amount of pages that students could print per semester to 300. So right now, and even back then, uh, it's the case that we have unlimited printing on campus um, at no, no cost to us other than our technology fee. SGA last year uh, very openly opposed the printing limit. The IT governance group uh, recognized this and didn't put the printing policy into effect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, uh, this year ro uh, rolls around and a similar proposal is brought to the Student Government Association to, to limit printing. Again, the Student Government Association, looking out for the best interests of the students, uh, shot down the printing proposal and signaled to the administration that we would like to keep unlimited printing for students. Lastly, um, in regards to our efforts, we have what is called student judicial programs on campus. Um, and essentially, if you break university policy, you'll likely go before the Student Judicial Programs Board um, for a hearing, and they will decide on uh, your guilt. The board is made up, um, I, sh I should mention this, is made up of students and faculty. Um, and historically, the board has had a shortage of students and certainly no equal representation. Um, so for the last two years, the Student Government Association has unanimously voted and requested that the administration allow equal representation uh, between faculty and students. Now, we haven't seen this happen just yet, but we have seen progress in the number of students serving on the board, which is certainly an exciting thing to see. It's progress. Um, however, the Student Government Association, again, looking out for the best interests of the students, will continue to stress the importance of fair representation of students to faculty on student judicial programs. Now, these are just a few of the many initiatives that SGA um, will take on in any given year. Uh, and certainly, SGA will always continue to work toward bettering uh, student life. But what makes it easier is if you reach out to these members alongside of the room, reach out to your senators, voice your concerns, because um, as long as we hear your concerns, we can try to come up with uh, better solutions for all of you. So that's SGA. And at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the podium to our student member to the Board of Trustees, Mr. Michael Quigley, um, to talk about the board. I just took that thing. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to thank you all for attending uh, this event today, and I can honestly say I did not expect this much of a turnout. It's, it's pretty overwhelming how many people came out and truly do care about the issues facing this uh, institution. Uh, with that being said, uh, I would like to off also offer thanks to both President Will Gradle and Speaker of the Senate Jacob Tomlinson, who really truly did the legwork for this uh, event to take place. Um, I would also like to thank the administration for your amazing support of this event to ensure that the student body is as informed as possible. So uh, I am the student member of the Board of Trustees, and many of you are probably wondering, what is the Board of Trustees? So uh, the Board of, Tr board of Trustees is an eight-member board, seven of which are appointed by the governor and one is elected by the student body. That's me. Um, we make the very long-term, five, 10, 20-year uh, decisions for the university, and what uh, what we do uh, tends, I'm sorry, what I do is that I voice the student concern on that board um, and I have been there for two years now and so I'm going to go ahead and move on. First and foremost, I think it's important uh, to address what probably is the most pressing question of everyone here today. Uh, WIU is not closing and even if you're a freshman, yes, you will be able to graduate in 2019. And if you have a high school sibling or friend, yes, they will be able to graduate from WIU in 2020. <clears throat> there you go. So I know that there are a vast array of rumors uh, all throughout the student body, rumors that we may close, rumors that cutting this or that would make everything all better. Rumors that this group or that group is being fairly untargeted or unfairly targeted. And uh, the first few weeks of the semester during SGA were actually spent dispelling 
the vast majority of these rumors, and now we're doing that for the student body as a whole. SGA President Will Gradle will do a phenomenal job here dispelling some of these issues, and the SGA Speaker of the Senate has already done a phenomenal job explaining what we do, and he actually did all of the legwork, research, and all that uh, on the pamphlet you are currently holding, or should be holding. So uh, I'd like to reiterate some of the things addressed by these gentlemen, as well as uh, give you the point of view of the student board of the student member to the Board of Trustees. First and foremost, I think that it's important to address <coughs> that by state law, separate budgets cannot be traded within the university without <coughs> a severe penalty. So much of our money is not necessarily liquid. That might be a lot of words, so I'm going to go ahead and break it down for you. For example, in your own personal finances, you may have $100 in your checking account and $100 in your savings account. So you have $200 to generally spend on whatever you want. A university budget does not work this way. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible, but there's essentially two pots of money, one of which is made from your tuition that you pay and from state appropriation, that's one budget, and another is student fees. Again, I'm keeping it very general. Having $100 in the state appropriated and tuition budget and having $100 in the student fee budget does not necessarily mean that the university has $200 to spend. That means that the university has $100 to spend on things that are legally okay to be spent out of for the state appropriations and your tuition and $100 to spend on, tuition or on uh, student fees and they cannot mix those two without some pretty severe penalties. So the tuition and state appropriated funds budget is of particular importance in the current impasse as most of the employees at Western are paid out of that chunk of money. So to, re to reiterate the pressure placed on the university from lack of funding, because the state has not funded us, for example, uh, would be that if there were only $20 left in the state appropriated in tuition budget, yet there were still $100 in the student fee budget. But the expenses of the state appropriated budget is well over $20. Um, the university cannot simply take anything out of that $100 to cover any shortfall. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. Um, you might be thinking, this is insane. Unfortunately, it's Illinois law. So when you look on your stars and your tuition and fees are billed separately, that's because that those are going into very different accounts that legally can only be used for those very specific things. So when you hear about a $500,000 entrance sign or new bleachers, meanwhile we're laying off professors, these, are two thing, these two things are very much unfortunately unrelated and have little to do with one another. Certainly they make great headlines and rallying points for angry people, but they are vastly different. One, one is paid for via student fee dollars and the other is paid for via your tuition and state appropriations. Because the state appropriated us zero dollars thus far this year, um, you can probably begin to understand why the personnel budget is suffering. Because the funds that traditionally pay for the vast majority of employees has been given a $50 million pay cut this year. Now, let's move on to what the Board of Trustees is doing or does. Discussing where WIU will be in 10, 20, and 30 years from now. Just this Friday, in fact, we're going to be getting a very long presentation uh, about the master plan update and discussing where the university is going to be again in 10, 20, and 30 years. So while many of you may be worried about will we be here in four years, I assure you the Board of Trustees is talking about things far, far past that. While the average student may be concerned with I heard X or Y, I, I want to assure you that the people at the very top are not the least bit concerned about going into next year or the year after that. Certainly we need state funding. But the administration has worked tirelessly to ensure that any innovative solution necessary will be achieved to ensure that our doors stay open. One of the best things we can do for the longevity of our university is absolutely to put pressure on our legislators, and I absolutely encourage you to do that. There you are. <laughs> But another integral part uh, of this equation is to dispel rumors. So rumors of closing down or ru rumors about certain programs cutting, et cetera, et cetera, they only harm the recruitment effort, which will only exacerbate our current issues. As I have addressed the quote, we will be closing next year rumor, which we are not, um, I would like to move on to program elimination rumors. So first and foremost, absolutely, there is currently a program elimination review process ongoing. Uh, from my understanding, that does not necessarily, and I did have this fact check this morning, so from, I put that in my original speech, but that does not necessarily mean uh, that the programs will be eliminated. There certainly is a chance of that happening forever. 
However, um, if you are a student in one of those programs, this is very important. The program will not just cease to exist the day after it's voted on to discontinue the program. There will absolutely be a phase-out system, and students in those programs will absolutely be allowed to complete their program. The savings from the program elimination would be long-term, as it would only stop new students from beginning the program. It is pivotal that our student body is as informed as possible. The most important, I'm sorry, the more inf informed our student body, the stronger our student body, and I hope to have been just a tiny part of strengthening the student body today, rather than dividing us through rumors or speculation. Don't take this information from today. Get comfortable knowing we're not going to close next year and then go into your residence hall and not tell anyone. Go out, tell your friends, tell prospective students, and tell your family. Thank you so much for your time and I hope I helped make uh, or maintain your confidence in Western Illinois University. And I would now like to introduce SGA President Will Gradle. Thank you. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, Leathernecks, welcome to what I hope to be a Student Government Association signature event, the State of the Student Address. Uh, this afternoon, I will speak about the budget impasse in Springfield and its devastating effects on higher education across this great state of Illinois. I'll talk about what your student government has done, uh, what we will continue to do, and how you can help make a difference. Lastly, I want to take some time to recognize uh, some of the amazing students that come to Western and demonstrate why Western continues to receive a steady stream of accolades and recognition. I want to thank all those who have taken their time uh, out of their busy schedule to be here. First, I want to thank President Thomas for his steadfast leadership and his dedicated direction through these tumultuous times. Thank you. <laughs> Additionally, I want to thank those vice presidents and directors who have worked tirelessly to find areas of greater efficiency while still maintaining the quality of the student experience here at Western. Thank you. <laughs> Faculty, thank you for striving ceaselessly to ensure that the needs of students always come first. There are no two ways about it. Our faculty are nothing short of remarkable. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you to the staff members across campus that strengthen and support our students. From FYE to SOC, students are afforded the opportunity to craft their soft skills and hone their character, aspects of university experience that are crucial for personal growth. I also want to offer my thanks to the support staff and civil service employees at the university. Without their hard work, our university would grind to a halt, so thank you. Lastly, I want to thank all of you. I want to thank the student leaders across campus that strive to better the experience for others. I can attest, as I'm sure everyone else on this campus can, that student leaders at this university are truly something to be proud of. My life and the lives of countless others have been positively affected by the students that are hungry for more out of their collegiate experience. So thanks to all of you. But looming over the warm glow of our community hangs a burden cast on us from Springfield. On the 1st of July, we began our fiscal year without any promise of an appropriated budget, though all signs showed that we would have one by the 4th of July. And then it was August, and then it was October, and then it was November, and January, and February, and now the uh, House of Representatives isn't meeting in March, uh, so they're saying possibly April, even as, as long-term as November. Our state appropriation, as well as MAP grant funding, is caught between unstoppable Democrats and immovable Republicans. Springfield is gambling with our future in a game of high-stakes chicken. This negligent and irresponsible behavior has had serious, uh, serious ramifications for higher education across the state, and Western is not immune to its effects. Looking outwardly, we have heard about the devastating impacts this impasse has had on Chicago State University, announcing just a few weeks ago that they were going to cut 900 positions. Eastern Illinois University has struggled with hundreds of layoffs. Community colleges across the state are struggling to make ends meet without the MAP grants. Northern Illinois University is uh, looking to cut $30 million from their budget. Southern Illinois University is looking to cut $40 million from their budget. Uh, and then looking inward, uh, our university has been forced by the state to make cuts of our own. Since December, the university has been abuzz with talks of layoffs and furloughs and the like. 
A few short weeks ago, the university announced a plan to cut $20 million over the next two fiscal years. The budget impasse is not, however, the whole story. The budget impasse is exacerbating an already existing and troublesome trend in institutions across the state. Illinois' population is on the decline and shows no signs of slowing down. We pair this fact with the reality that Illinois is the nation's number two net exporter of students and a grim truth is realized. Fewer people are attending Illinois schools which deplete each and every university's ability to generate revenue and offer competitive student services. The state is creating a catch-22 from which higher education cannot escape. First, the state reduces uh, appropriations. Second step, universities raise tuition to meet the subsequent budgetary shortfall. Three, fewer students attend Illinois schools due to the higher cost, limiting the abilities for schools to pay for themselves. Step four, the state government feels that schools must be too bloated because tuition is so high, neglecting the fact that our school alone has seen a reduction of $32 million over the last 13 years when you adjust it for inflation. And then we're being asked to cut another $10 million. Step five, schools across the state are left scrambling to make ends meet because the state has asked us for far too much far too quickly. In this circular, repeating process, the state has created a crisis of confidence, a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's important at this point to, uh, to ensure that we are all on the same page when it comes to looking at how our university allocates its resources. If you picked up uh, one of the budget fact books, I encourage you to thumb through it. And you'll, uh, you'll, we need to take a few things into consideration. You'll find that there's a bar graph with three pools of money. These three pools cannot be mixed, similar to uh, how Trustee Quigley explained. And that is to say that if we wanted to allocate more money towards, say, faculty payroll, we would be unable to take the money from athletics and allocate it to, the, to that area. So over the last year, I've worked hard uh, to hear the comments, questions, concerns of students, and a question I've heard asked dozens of times uh, is, how is it that we can pay to repair the bell tower, but we're talking about cuts and furloughs? Uh, and the answer to that question is that there are different pools of money and we are legally required to use them for different purposes. In the face of all these questions and confusion, the question has been asked time and time again uh, whether or not we'll be open in the fall. To quote Dr. Thomas, we've been open for 117 years and we'll be open, open for 117 more. And I personally have two remaining years on this campus and I look forward to spending them with all of you. Our <laughs> Our ability to survive the budget impasse is without question. We look to Springfield to determine whether or not higher education in Illinois will thrive in the coming years. The truth is that not only do 2,700 students at WIU rely on MAP grant funding, but 130,000 students across the state uh, do as well. MAP grants are, by definition, given to the lowest income students and are often the difference between whether or not someone can return to continue their education. The state government's refusal to fund MAP grants uh, to students is an assault on the financial st stability of those students who arguably need the most help. It's important to know that MAP grants are not the whole ballgame. In addition to being paid back the $11 million that the university fronted for MAP grants, Western also needs its state appropriation of $50 million. Uh, reference back earlier to when I mentioned the three separate pools of money both the $11 million as well, uh, of MAP grants as well as the $50 million of state appropriation. Uh, all goes towards uh, the state appropriation fund, which pays for our professors and pays for our education. Never mind the fact that the state is holding on to money that was supposedly released to us for a new performing arts center. So we ask ourselves, what's the holdup? To put it plainly, it's petty, partisan, political posturing. Democrats are refusing to work with Republicans and Republicans are refusing to work with Democrats. To be sure, there are certainly philosophical differences between the two camps. But that, uh, then those differences can certainly make compromise a problematic situation. However, nine months without a budget cannot be chalked up to ph philosophical differences alone. And how do we know this? I've had both Republican and Democratic legislators tell me how badly they want to fund MAP grant and how badly they want to fund higher education as a whole. But Springfield has gone nine months without an authentic regard for its constituency, us. Uh, spring, uh, Republicans are afraid to break the rank with Rauner, and Democrats are afraid to break rank from Madigan and Cullerton. All the while, 800,000 students across the state are left in no man's land. It's worth pointing out that students are not, not the only ones victimized by the budget impasse. The $50 million of state funding 
buys $300 million of economic impact across the region. In economics, this phenomenon is referred to as the multiplier effect. It's the idea that government spending spurs the economy and introduces new spending that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Estimates assert that the university contributes a third of a billion dollars to the local economy. By refusing to adequately fund our university, the state government is actively choosing to hurt the economic well-being of West Central Illinois, as well as every other region with a school in it. There is no doubt that the inaction of the state government has had a profoundly destructive impact on higher education in Illinois. I've had many faculty members tell me that the budget crisis doesn't affect students. Our tuition is locked. What do we have to worry about? If you need evidence that diminished state appropriations are affecting students, listen to the students who have openly said time and time again that their favorite professors can no longer work at the university because the state has provided the university with insufficient funds, or in, this, in the case of this year, no funds at all. There can be no doubt that losing the professor that inspires you to be a better student, be a better person, can be a stressor on you, at a time when students are already stressed. There are those students at other schools that don't know what the rest of their academic career looks like. As students go closer and closer to the commencement date, they grow closer and closer to looking down the barrel of the rest of their lives. And for some students, they don't even know if they'll make it that far. But all of these effects are to be expected in uncertain times. Let's look at the, the uh, aside from the expected effects of our new reality, there exists a growing and pervasive consensus among Illinois college and university students. Prior to the budget impasse, I think it's fair to say that students generally didn't look at the state government with any true sense of scrutiny. For the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of students in, in higher education in Illinois, that's all there's left to do, scrutinize the state government. And now that the, state, the student body of this state has awoken to the realities plaguing our, plaguing our state, it is collectively deciding that living in Illinois simply does not ROI. Despite living in Illinois and paying taxes in Illinois, the state doesn't have the, the interests of the students in mind. There's simply little return on our enormous investment in the form of taxes. A generation of students are being trained by the state government to look elsewhere to live, to work, to build a families when they graduate. Sorry, I lost my spot, that's a little embarrassing. <laughs> uh, I think it's fair to say that this is one of the most significant effects of the budget impasse on students. Not only is it defining our collegiate experience, it's also defining the trajectory of the rest of our lives. And despite the best efforts of students and faculty and alumni and trustees and university presidents, the state's leadership has not budged. Despite countless letter writing campaigns, despite an unprecedented student advocacy day in the fall, despite rallies at institutions across the state as well as in Springfield, uh, despite students at other institutions not returning to school because of the MAP grant issue, despite the thousands of scheduled layoffs across the state, nothing seems to be good enough to move the needle. Two weeks ago, your student government formed a committee to specifically address the actions that can be taken by students to further the advocacy efforts in higher education and to highlight the very positive areas which are so negatively affected by the budget impasse. I want to offer my commendation to those senators around the room who have stepped up to the challenge for fighting for their university. And today we are launching the Impasse Impact Movement, a social media campaign aimed at highlighting all of the areas in our community that are affected by the budget impasse. We'll be sharing videos, pictures, and stories highlighting those areas of impact that are often ignored. If you have a story to tell, we want you to tell it. So tweet, share pictures on Instagram, post stories on Facebook, all the while using the hashtag #ImpasseImpact. We cannot afford for our voices and our community to be overshadowed by petty political partisanship. But there's more to do. We're in the process of planning another student advocacy day in April. My hope is that you will take it upon yourselves to join us and to speak with as many legislator, legislators as possible because Illinois and its public institutions cannot afford to wait any longer. We cannot afford to wait any longer. We won't, we won't see any progress until we can convince our representatives that they must do the right thing, not the thing that is convenient for their party leaders. We need to tell Springfield about the residence hall programs that have raised over $22,000 over the last year for various philanthropic efforts. We have to share the stories of our Greek organizations who volunteer tens of thousands of community service hours each and every school year, as well as the $100,000 they raise for their various philanthropies. We, yeah, absolutely, absolutely.
We, we have to tell them about organizations like Talk App Epsilon, which is ranked in the top 10% of chapters by their national organization. Yeah. We have to tell them about Dance Marathon, an organization that's raised over $150,000 in its first three years on campus, raising $70,000 this spring alone. <laughs> we have to tell our legislators about our incredible students like Jeremy McCool, Mario Calero, Alberto Ricanti, Hannah Drake, Kyle Russell, Chrissy Simmons, who have won local, regional, and national accolades for their research and application of their studies. We have to tell the state government about the truly incredible student leaders we have on this campus. We have to tell them about Jillian Ross, who advanced to be a finalist in the prestigious Truman Award. It's, give it up for her. <laughs> With an institution uh, as truly remarkable as ours is, it comes as no surprise that WIU has a legacy of producing Illinois' most remarkable leaders. From CEOs like Class of 76 graduate Patrick Magoon of Lurie's Children's Hospital to a noted activist, author, and speaker Aaron Marin, uh, who graduated in 2008, Western has served to produce the best and the brightest. You see, the thing is this. Our state cannot afford to underfund Western Illinois University. Our state cannot afford to underfund higher education. If this state wants to have a competitive advantage in business in, on the national stage, in art on the national stage, in science, and in music on the national stage, it starts at U of I, it starts at ISU, it starts at Western Illinois University. For even in the darkest of times, we must remember that there's always a light, a student's lamp to guide us through the night. Thank you all, and God bless Western Illinois University. I yield the floor. Thank you all very much for coming out. Uh, thank you again. Uh, senators, I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Are there any objections? Seeing none, meeting adjourned.